Welcome to The Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. Just like always, you're with Ian and Mike as we carry on our circumnavigation of the orb rematchery novels of Patrick O'Brien. Mike, last week we just about got started with the story of Desolation Island. Could, could you catch us up? Whereabouts are Jack and Stephen and what action have we already heard about? You bet. It- Well, Jack and Stephen had just gotten started on their new voyage in the, as we always hear it, the horrible old leopard. (laughs) But it can't be horrible anymore because Jack now has command of her. Now, Jack is fleeing some troubles of his own making ashore. Uh, Kind of a familiar story here. (laughs) He's left behind kind of a half-built-out silver mine, a part-completed house renovation, some expensive racehorses and a worried spouse with the with the three children now. Mm-hmm. And Stephen, sadly, has left behind some further heartbreak in the form of Diana abandoning him once again. Yeah. And he's now in the process on board the Leopard of really plumbing Diana's friend, Louisa Wogan, who is apparently an American spy who's aboard the Leopard being transported to the penal colony in Botany Bay. And it's Stephen's mission to find out about her and her intelligence and, uh, you know, perhaps to make whatever best use he can of her. So they've also got other prisoners on board. They did that to provide cover to make it not stand out why Mrs. Wogan alone is on here. And those prisoners have brought with them troubles of their own, uh, jail fever that we we really started looking at last week. And it's funny, Stephen has been, he's been just about rebuilding his self-respect and his self-esteem. And he's started to play the role of a really, really first-class intelligence agent with this maneuver with uh, Louisa Wogan. But I think he's also going to have to play the role again of uh, a physician and surgeon. So what are we looking forward to then this week? What's what's coming up, Mike? Well, we're headed again for the Cape of Good Hope in the Indian Ocean. Yeah. And the leopard will have to pass through the doldrums, the roaring 40s and the high southern latitudes. And that's never an easy voyage. We remember that from the Mauritius Command. Oh, it wasn't last time. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. when you have a healthy crew and a well-found ship, that's not an easy voyage. And, and it looks like we're going to be far from either of those. Yeah. Now. Presumably, there are enemies over the horizon. Let's just say we're going to be covering one of the most gripping and talked about ship-to-ship action set pieces in the whole cabin. Oh, yeah. I can't wait. This is one of those moments that really, I, I think, are going to stick in the mind. I'm really looking forward to getting stuck into this. So that's great. Thanks, Mike. Now, jail fever, and by the way, I don't think we've got any kind of detailed clinical knowledge about what what fever this would be there's a really horrible echo of present day times isn't there we've got an infectious disease breaking out aboard a closed community and i, I guess this would almost have been okay if they could have kept sailing and made it to shore and made it to medical care and maybe also been able to set some of the infected patients ashore but the leopard hits the doldrums hits the the calm windless zones around the equator much earlier than expected and the fever starts to spread and there's as we get quite a few times in this book i think really almost sickening dread as the the ship slowed right down they've got downpours and they've got rain and they've got no idea how long it's going to be before they can move again and again, Mike, they've quarantined the front part of the ship. They've sealed off the infected zone of the ship where we've got Stephen and his assistant and his patients. And Mike, this sounds like a lot like our world right now, doesn't it? Well, it really does. I mean, I couldn't help. I, I was listening to this and uh, I was driving, you know, perhaps not the best combination. And I was kind of dealing with the current pandemic and, you know, what I couldn't, couldn't do here and you know, high 90 degrees in in Florida. Mm -hmm. And I found myself just getting really sad. And I realized that this whole description of what was going on on the leopard sounded a lot like my life. Not to mention the fact that, you know, it's kind of like you've got the jail feeder, but you've got also have all this other stuff going on. You know, we're running out of fresh water. We're, you know, we're running out, you know, there's just a lot of stuff happening here. And you think, oh my gosh, everything all at once. It sounds like, you know, let me turn off the news station as well. <laughs> and it does seem that they start to comment on how 
that dread and that lack of hope was really getting to the crew. There's a quote here that runs, apart from the perpetual supply of fresh rainwater, the circumstances were as bad as they could be. The excessive dread and general despondence had, had come over the whole crew. When the disease struck the lower deck, it killed men faster than the plague. They gave up hope. And sometimes it seemed to Stephen that they would almost as soon not take his drafts, but would rather have it over as soon as might be. So people are almost giving up the fight because sticking around in this miserable, becalmed, filthy, sweaty, hot situation doesn't seem like doesn't seem like a worthwhile endeavor. As you say, and they seem to have given up, and despite the evidence, I mean, O'Brien writes that there are now 11 convalescents, men who've survived their crisis, yet in spite of this clear evidence, there were those who would die, who resigned themselves almost thankfully to death the moment they were brought in. And, and Stephen starts to wonder aloud to his assistant, Martin, he said, you know, if only a French ship could be seen approaching, if only we could hear the drumbeat and the sound of guns in earnest, several of our cases would cure themselves and the admissions would fall off to a wonderful degree. And, and his assistant agrees. He, you know, he, he notes a, an old authority saying spirit is three quarters of the remedy, yeah. but who can dose or measure spirit? <laughs> It's a real challenge for Stephen as, as as a physician. I think he also talks later on about how this is really a nursing challenge as much as a, a curative challenge. He's got to just look after these patients as they go through the crisis. And I was really, oh, I don't know. Tom Pullings comes in as a patient <gasps> and Stephen sets up this really sort of optimistic, oh, you've come to the right shop. We've caught it early enough. It's going to be fine. And that's very obviously him setting high expectations to try and keep pulling spirits up. But as a reader of the books and a fan of Pullings, you're reading this thinking, oh gosh, not Pullings, come on. No, no. And the social distancing thing gets worse and worse. <laughs> well, I'm gratified to see that Stephen is using social distancing. I mean, O'Brien's very specific yeah. in pointing this out. He <laughs> says, you know, you know, Stephen, there's funeral after funeral, and Stephen wants to do his duty as an officer as well and go on board for the funerals, but he's coming out of the sealed space, the quarantine area, and says he goes no further than the main the main tech block. He stood there with his hat off while the service was read and the dead seamen moved down the side into the viscid water. And after this, he conversed with Jack at a distance of some 10 yards. So not six feet, mind you, 10 yards. No, no. <laughs> Easy enough in that still air and that silent ship. So here's Stephen, social distancing, staying home, staying in quarantine and, and keeping everybody on. Yeah. But it's, it's taken quite a toll on him, on the ship. I mean, we learn that Stephen's assistant dies. Yeah. Stephen himself can barely go on. He's he's kind of exhausted himself taking care of everybody. And uh, O'Brien just writes how he keeps falling asleep wherever he stands or sits, but he presses himself on and on. And despite all this pushing on and on, the crew of the ship continued to be decimated. I think it was something something like half of the ship's crew. I haven't got the figure in front right. of me, but we get the, the very clear steer that the, the ship's crew is now pretty much done as a fighting unit because so many of them have been lost. And there are plenty that are still only just barely convalescent, including pullings. Right, right. And there's, there's so much death here. It's funny. In, in another writer, I think we might have seen the temptation to do to do a deathbed scene, if you like. And I'm wondering, maybe we can talk about that because I think the way that O'Brien depicts death and when he chooses to depict it and what context he gives it seems to be quite different from lots of other books that you might think of as being in the same genre. It really does, Ian. I mean, we've had some very poignant death scenes, but not kind yeah. of what you usually expect in, in, as you say, writers in a genre like this, writers particularly in a military story. Yeah. So I've, I've got a bit of a theory that there are some cliche death moments that we encounter. And I don't want to be too sort of dark and ghoulish about this, but there seem to be some accepted, as I say, cliches about how we depict death. So, and we're talking about the death of significant characters because, of course, if you if you if you watch Star Trek, you know that the guys in red shirts are sent down on the planet just to be mowed down by the by the aliens. You know, if you watch an Indiana Jones movie, you know that the palace guards just turn up one after another to be, you know, biffed about the face by uh, by Indiana Jones. So, but the death of a significant character seems to attract some particular kinds of depictions. So, I'm going to say cliche death number one, especially for military movies, is that lingering agony death. 
mm. thinking about the the death of Sergeant Elias in Platoon. You know, the famous scene of the guy finally shot in the back with his hands up. Um, the death of Snowden in Catch Twenty Two, which is talked about all the way through the book and is finally told in a narration by Yossarian right at the end. And I, it's possible for these to be very voyeuristic and in bad taste, but they do happen sometimes with, with decent, I think, writing intent. And they seem to be there to show the impact on the witnesses, either the impact on other characters or impact mm. on us as readers. And we're asked to witness this horrible moment of somebody passing away and it transforms us and it leaves a bit of a scar and people will come away from that thinking, I wish I hadn't seen that. And uh, there were one or two mentions of deaths in combat by O'Brien, you know, somebody being taken to bits by a cannon, but we don't get any of the ghoulish blood and cuts. Right. <laughs> At least not to the extent that you might expect from somebody with like 1960s, 1970s sensibility. No. And Mike, I have my second archetype here, which is the valedictory death, the farewell death. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the dying hero clasps the sergeant's hat and says, you know, take care of my kids or look after my gal. Lingering deaths like the death of Dobby in Harry Potter, uh, the death of Tom Hanks, Captain Miller in Saving Private Ryan. But this seems to be a kind of moment where the audience is asked to either process some of their own grief or evaluate a message that's passed on by the dying character. And we're, I think we're meant to believe that the person that's dying is has got some good or has got a worthwhile message to pass on. And we're sort of meant to feel good about the fact that we witnessed it, even though it's a sad event, that we get something, we get some redemption or fulfillment. Now, O'Brien, I don't think, does either of those two things. He doesn't give us lingering agony, and he doesn't give us kiss me hardy, to take the Nelson example. He doesn't give me you know, right. farewell. And deaths are written about in this really quite short, matter-of-fact way. They're often reported secondhand, um, maybe with the exception of Canning in the Duel. That was quite a sort of immediate first-person description. But we're as the reader, with a reader's point of view, we're very, very rarely there at the moment, at the end of someone's life. And even here, the death of the first few prisoners of jail fever we read that in, in his patience and gleaming eyes, Stephen read ultimate disappointment. And then it goes on to say, between two and four in the morning, they all died. And and we're not there. We get deaths of jail fever referred to secondhand. We hear that the, the log normally written by the clerk, it says now it was Jack's far rougher hand that wrote the daily list for his clerk had gone over the side with two cannonballs to carry him down. And as you said, Mike, Martin, Stephen's assistant, passes away from the fever. It said nursing had actually saved Martin, who in fact died later from a pneumonia that struck him days after the favourable termination of the crisis. So this seems like a stylistic thing. We're not ever going to be up close and voyeuristic with death. Death is treated in a very matter-of-fact way. Like lots of other things, I guess, we're expected to see the impact of it through its consequences with other people and its consequences reported later on. What do you think? Well, I, I think you're right, and it's interesting. I think sometimes, you know, writers have a, a real purpose uh, here. J.K. Rowling, I know, was criticized for the death of so many characters that we cared about. It seemed like, you know, some people would say unnecessary carnage. And, and she explained that yeah. in her mind, they were necessary to show the impact of evil. Yeah. But but I don't see a message like that here. Sometimes, you know, Brian's writing you know, he's so good at the day to day, everything that happens and, and, you know, the hours and the routine. And I wonder if some of this was very much a reality, you know, when we're in India, yeah. people yeah. like Dill die all the time yeah. when we're on board a ship. Yeah. Life is cheap. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, he's reminded us so many times throughout the canon thus far, you know, you're only two feet of wood between you and your ultimate demise in the midst of an ocean. And, um, yeah. and that, you know, over any horizon could be an enemy ship that a doldrums can, you know, can do you in just as much as the enemy. So as the same way he does kind of this fabulous job with this routine on ship, he writes of death and the glass turns and the bell is struck and we move on, yeah. you know, some reflection, mm-hmm. Stephen, you know, reflects back on Dill and Clonford. Jack reflects back on some of that personal, vicious hand-to-hand fighting or when he, you know, is yeah. reacting back to the deaths resulting from Stephen's rescue. But you're right, not not the kind of way we see it in other writers. No, and I think particularly not the way we see it in lots of stories about war. And one of the ancient benchmarks that I think O'Brien really regarded as a, as a as a model or as a high point would have been the, the the epic poetry of homer and the iliad and the odyssey 
And the Iliad is absolutely a story that's about war, just like a war movie is in most cases about war. But I think we're learning a little that the O'Brien books are not about war, certainly not exclusively, certainly not right. mostly. You know, in the same way that Jaws isn't about a shark, I don't think the O'Brien books are really about the Napoleonic Wars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. They're, you know, they use that as a setting for life and and for people. Yeah. And he's taken care of a lot of humanity as the crew numbers have gone down in the doldrums. And since it was the doldrums that heightened the crisis of this jail fever outbreak. It's another kind of weather. It's the breeze. It's the trade winds that get the ship out of the immediate crisis. And after almost a month, the tide turns and the wind blows again. Yeah. Stephen goes out on deck and sees, O'Brien writes, a new and brilliant day, a new and healthy sea, transparent, tonic air, the ship alive. And even, you know, even our grumpy old Killick, it says Killick had been on the watch and now he ran forward with coffee pot and biscuit, laid them carefully in a coil of rope at the appointed place, the limit of the forbidden ground, retreated and called out, good morning, sir. This is what we've been praying for. Uh, Amen. Boy, I, I tell you, this was another, I think this was on that same trip, but coming back home and I remember I started to cry a little bit. I, <laughs> I was like, yeah, yes, that's what it, we're praying. <laughs> and I think also this is this is making me think back to Mauritius Command, which of course was a great book with loads of O'Brien humor and touches in it. But as I've been reading Desolation Island, I've been thinking, yeah, this this rhythm of emotional, you know, highs and lows and and payoff and tension and reward, even though some of them are hard to read, is actually making it for a more rewarding book. I think yes. that we've had this real grim foreboding with the jail fever. And I just remember turning the page and reading and the wind blew and Killick says, this is what we've been praying for. And I just got this great release, like, Oh, thank the Lord. And not to put, not to put in too many spoilers. I think we're going to get some more of those lows and highs as we go through this particular story. It's so true. I mean, this one really had me, you know, with kind of fingernails or fingers white, yeah. you know, gripping yeah. the, the desk or the seats. And in those southern latitudes, you know, going up to the top of that wave and then boom, down into the middle and back up to the yeah. top again and wondering if I get turned sideways, this may be all she wrote. Here. And interestingly, even when we're in the in the upbeat mode of things are okay and the wind is blowing again, it's not a hundred percent there because we still don't know about pullings. It's not for a few pages that we find out that actually Pullings is alive, but he's still really sick and we're going to have to see him set on shore somehow. You're right. I mean, we get all this thing about how, you know, the people are happy and men start running and they're cheerful, but the ship is decimated. And even the people like in the sick bay, they talk about how they're starting to lift their heads up and talk and everything. We're starting to find out that it's had an incredible effect that, you know, like 116 men have died. 65 are still sick. Jack only has like 120 men that he can use at the moment. Yeah. And and Stephen tells him that, as a matter of fact, you know, you, you've only got that 120 now. And unless we can get this ship ashore, I'm, you know, we're likely to lose a lot more. We, you know, we need medical supplies. We need some of the right diet. and we got to get some like Tom Pullings on shore because they won't make it if they stay on the ship. Stephen and Jack get to collaborate together again on figuring out what's the best way to get the ship and the crew healthy and also make progress with the mission. I'm getting a sense as well that Stephen's got his his mojo back a little bit because yeah. the gleam of an intelligence coup uh, in, arising from his manipulation of Louisa Wogan and Michael Herapath seems to be coming a little bit more than just a gleam, but we might we might talk about that some more in a second. Yeah. Meanwhile, Jack has got, as you say, Mike, 120 men he can use. He's got to figure out a way to sail and fight. He says, 60 hands to a watch. God help us. 60 hands in a 50-gun ship. Right. And he's also facing, if they're going to have to put Tom Pullings ashore, along with a bunch of other convalescents, he's going to have Mr. Grant as his first lieutenant. He's not got a completely happy, completely stable gun room life is not going to be the same for the leopard i don't think there's any obvious route of seamanship or tactics that can get jack back to being 100 percent on mission again right and we've had so many instances in the past where jack's had time to shape his crew to form his crew and we haven't had that here really they've they've gone through all this they haven't been able to do a lot of the things that jack would normally do 
So he's got some of the crew that are old Sophies and old Polycrests and, you know, folks that he knows, but he's got a lot that don't know him and a lot that are still kind of lovers. And, yeah. and you've got this guy, Grant, who just seems to be, you know, certainly is convinced that he ought to be in charge. He's been ill used and has to take, yeah. you know, not quite to the degree that, that Clonford used to, but, you know, tries to take every opportunity to point out what Jack's doing wrong and what he would do different were he in command. Absolutely. So we're going to stop at Brazil for fresh supplies and putting the patients ashore. We would have expected, I think, in many of the Patrick O'Brien stories for this to be a moment for Stephen to step ashore and come back with vampires and sloths and other animal encounters. But actually, it shows how important this moment is. Stephen's building an intelligence position here that might allow him to send false intelligence back. If he can just successfully manipulate the perception of Michael Herapath that he, Stephen, is, is not any kind of a threat, but is a friend to Irish independence and to colonials. And if he can do the same with regard to Louisa Wogan, he sees a real opportunity to do something great. So he actually disingenuously starts asking Herapath to start escorting Mrs. Wogan, the Mrs. Wogan who turned all the heads in the first couple of chapters. Right. He says, Herapath, why don't, why don't you take her on deck? You know, you can escort her during exercise time. Stephen is carrying letters ashore for Mrs. Wogan and Herapath. They trust him with their mail, and he gets this chance to read their mail. So he's put them together, building their confidence, and he's sitting across their channel of communication back out to the rest of the world. This is home territory. This is where Stephen Maturin eats. <laughs> but Jack's not so happy. <laughs> It's so amazing that, you know, Jack is so completely taken aback, just affronted that that Stephen would open a seal and read their mail. <laughs> and, um, and Stephen pipes in as only Stephen can. He says, you know, Captain Aubrey would do his utmost to deceive an enemy by the use of false colors and false signals, by making him believe that his ship was a harmless merchantman, a neutral or a compatriot. And by any other ruse that might occur to his fertile mind, all was fair in war, all except for opening letters and listening behind doors. <laughs> but if Stephen, <laughs> on the other hand, could bring Bonaparte one inch nearer to the brink of hell by opening letters, he would happily violate a whole mail coach full. And Stephen, <laughs> Stephen says to Jack, you will read captured dispatches with open glee and exultation, he said, for you can see that they are public papers. But if you value candor, you must therefore admit that any document bearing on the war is also a public paper. You are to rid your mind of these weak prejudices. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. You tell, you tell him. <laughs> <laughs> so Stephen's getting his game on again. He's feeling like he has a place in the world. He can absolutely call Jack out for this week superstition. We're going to hear more about Jack's weak superstitions as the story goes on, I think. And he already gets a bit of a payoff from this, I think, because he, he finds out that Mrs. Wogan has written to Diana and there's nothing in there, it seems, to implicate Diana. So he gets to set that concern aside, the concern that maybe Diana was implicated in this spying ring. But it's very clear that Herapath's letter is a coded communication originally from Mrs. Wogan to her masters in the intelligence service. And Stephen gets to make copies of both letters and he's got the chance to send them back to Sir Joseph. So we're, I think we're all smiling at this and thinking, yay, for Stephen, he's back in form. Right, right. And maybe we can just stay with this this thread of Stephen and Herapath and Wogan because he's got the chance to draw them even more deeply, I think, into his confidence. Well, I think it's a, it's a great idea. He's, you know, he is, as you say, he's really back in his fine form as a top level intelligence agent. He's even found her code <laughs> breaking guide. He's now passed that on to Sir Joseph. And he's brought them as only Stephen can into his confidence. They both think the world of him. Herapath even confesses to Stephen. He says, you know, I, I can't continue with this dissimulation. I, he confesses that he's known Mrs. Wogan. He's in love with her. He's stowed aboard to be with her. Stephen's known this all along. And Stephen continues to deepen his tie to Herapath to help get Herapath closer to Mrs. Wogan and her affections again. Yeah. He continues to learn all about her political activities, her intelligence contacts. I think Herapath is 
perhaps a little a little in the dark here. I think you know Mrs. Wogan is a little bit using Herapath. And so Herapath freely is talking about who she sees, who she knows and everything. Yeah. Stephen thinks, you are the most wretched companion for a conspirator that was ever yet seen. Unless, indeed, you're a prodigy of depth and cunning. So he's not going to take it for granted. Yeah. But it's funny, I was thinking, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of Herapath? Lots of secondary characters are put in these stories to act as sort of grist in the mill, the grit in the oyster. They get in the way of people achieving what they're trying to achieve and they cause misunderstanding and they cause friction. You know, Dylan, Clonfort, all the other secondary characters that we've seen. But Herapath's role is to be there. He's an easy, soft pitch for Stephen to hit out of the park. <laughs> right, right. He's being used by Louisa Wogan, who's kind of stringing him along. He's being used by the author, Patrick O'Brien, as a vehicle for Stephen to get his get his chops back together. So it's a pretty grim time for Herapath. It is. It is. And luckily, we find out that Herapath does have a little something to console him. You know, Stephen's amazed to learn that Herapath has, in the past, turned to smoking opium. Yeah. And that when Louisa Wogan left him earlier in his life, um, he he really fell into a deep habit but was able to come back again and use it in a controlled way. And now Stephen finds him as, as something much more valuable. You know, when, when Herapath says, you know, I can take it or leave my pipe, in reality, Herapath tells him it's no longer the malignant, evil, necessary monster that it once was. And, and tells him, in fact, that he's left it 5,000 miles away. It's something that he uses for mere pleasure, something when he has a, a special task he wants some endurance for, or a rare emergency. And Stephen really can't believe this. Do you tell me, Mr. Herapath, that having broke the habit, you're able to return to a moderate and pleasurable use of the drug? Oh, yes, sir. And in the intervals, you do not crave? The craving did not return? No, sir. After the clean break, it did not. The opium was my old accustomed friend again. I could address myself to it when I chose or refrain. I think this is probably, on the one hand, may be some comfort to Stephen and may also scare him to death. I don't know. It would scare me to death. Absolutely. Uh, but we know also that Stephen hasn't really got a very balanced perspective no. on opium. He's he's very good at self-deception. Right, right. So Herapath and Stephen having this very candid conversation about opium as a prop, or in Stephen's case, obviously opium as a bit of a curse. Meanwhile, though, Stephen's got this great opportunity for an intelligence coup he can develop a secret document that he can plant with herapath and louisa wogan it says here it consisted of drawing up a statement in french describing the british intelligence network in france and other parts of western europe with details of double agents bribes treason in the ministries designed to cause disruption in paris if there were in fact a connection between mrs wogan and the french and it was intended to be conveyed to those chiefs by mrs wogan herself by means of Herapath. This is going to be great. This is a, an intelligence coup that could be the highlight of Stephen's career. As long as he can get this false intelligence together in time, as long as he can get it safely into Herapath and Louisa's hands, and as long as they continue not to suspect him for who he really is, he stands to pull off a big coup. And it says in the book, Stephen had poisoned many sources of intelligence in his time, but if all went well, this promised to be the prettiest piece of intoxication that he had ever brought about. Right. Right. And I like O'Brien's choice of the of the word intoxication <laughs> with a link back <laughs> to the conversation we were just having about opium. Too true. So rather than poisoning himself with opium, he gets to poison the French and indirectly the Americans. So Mike, speaking of intoxication, maybe this is a good time to go and refresh ourselves and invite the listeners to go and refresh themselves. Right, right, right. If you're your pipe's 5,000 miles away. Maybe you've got a big quart jar of laudanum on the shelf, or maybe you just need to go and make a cup of coffee. Whichever it is, enjoy it, and we'll be right back after this break.
Welcome back. Welcome. You're listening to The Lubber's Hole. We're talking about Patrick O'Brien. It may even be that during our little break there, you took a moment to check out our Facebook page, which is facebook.com forward slash lubber's hole. It may also be that you took a moment to go check us out on Twitter, where we are at whole lubbers. But if you didn't, that's okay. There's still plenty of opportunities to interact with us. Tell us what you think of the show. Tell us what you'd like to hear about more and we'll make it all part of our conversation. Yeah, we really do appreciate it. We're getting great comments. We're getting great comments on Apple Podcasts, great comments. In Google, we're getting great comments on Facebook, including, as Ian says, what you like and what you'd love for us to do differently. We're playing with the sound levels to make sure that as you're out there biking and walking that you can hear us a bit better. So thanks for all of your feedback so far. We're looking forward to lots and lots more of that. So, Mike, to get back into our story, things were looking up. We've recovered from jail fever. We've set our convalescence ashore in Brazil. Stephen's got this great intelligence coup that he's plotting that looks like it could succeed. What's going on on the naval side of things? Well, on the naval side of things, we've you know we've tucked in to Brazil, and Stephen is really anxious to get to the to the Cape and to make sure that, you know, in addition to the things that he's mailed from Brazil, he wants to get to the Cape and dump off these poisoned intelligence documents. So they get to the American council there on the Cape, but we're not sure that that's going to happen as, you know, O'Brien is really good about giving us a little foreshadowing. And as they're docked in Brazil, there's another ship, the Nymph headed for Jamaica they're, they've come from the Cape and they've got some dispatches, but they let Jack know that they've run into a Dutch 74, the Voxum height. Did I say that right, Ian? You did good pronunciation. Well done. Uh, well, I, I listened to Patrick Tall again right before we got on because I thought every time I look at this written, I think I have no idea how to say that. So. <laughs> It'd be great for Scrabble, though. If that was a Scrabble answer, you'd be like, oh, my gosh, you'd be in trouble figures. <laughs> Some points here. Right. So you know, the nymph that had had a little run in here, had you know lost its foremask there or at least got it wounded. And he warns Jack that if he were in Aubrey's place. He would give them a very wide berth because she's a fair sailor, O'Brien writes, commanded by a determined fellow who understands his business, and she is well manned. He notes that she fired three broadsides in a little over five minutes. Whoa. That's pretty fair gunnery, especially by Jack Aubrey standards, three in five minutes. He realizes that they must be on their way to reinforce the Dutch fleet in the Spice Islands, and the, the Vaxam Height and the Leopard are going to have to steer more or less the same course, at least as far as the Cape. And Jack's faced with the idea that he's undermanned, he's going to be outgunned if he comes anywhere near encountering this bigger, fully crewed Dutch ship. He's going to think, I have to not get tangled up with them. Right. It'd be a 74-gun ship against a 50-gun ship when the 50-gun ship probably can't fight even half her guns at one time. And he hasn't really got a complete set of officers he can rely on either. He's got Babington and he's got Moore, and they seem solid and he knows them well. But Grant, it says here, Grant was a dead weight. He'd served in transport, harbor duties and exploration, so he'd become a good navigator but he didn't really know, it says. He didn't, didn't really know the inward nature of a fight at sea, nor did he seem willing to learn. Right. His attitude, his tolerably obvious attitude, infected many of those whose idea of battle was as hazy as his own. General smoke and thunder at close quarters with the Royal Navy winning. Now, there's the attitude of Grant then and his followers who think, well, so what if we meet the Dutchman? The Royal Navy always wins. And it's going to be easy for them, I think, to look down their noses a little bit at the more seasoned naval campaigners who can really see the risks of running into the Vaxa height when she'll have such a weight of advantage in terms of guns and weight of broadside and men aboard. Yeah, such a huge crew that could really devastate them if they ever had the chance to board. So nonetheless, Jack's getting his preparation in, even though he's only got half a crew, he decides that he's going to try and bring the gunnery up to the highest possible standard. And I really like the way he brings Killick, his steward, in on the act because he wants to use the guns that are in the captain's stateroom. Killick really hates the idea of anything that upsets the the spit and polish in uh, in Jack's living space. 
So he has this genius idea of letting Killick fire. Killick was there, it said, eyeing the slow match that was to fire the gun, much as a terrier might eye a rat or a groom his bride. A single shot would make him civil, even obliging for a week. Yeah, this this is just such a marvelous example of the way Patrick O'Brien brings secondary characters to life, much to our great enjoyment. He does, and we've got Killick coming to life a little bit. We've also got some of the prisoners coming to life. We've had we, we return to the fact that there are women aboard the ship, and that stimulates a whole line of. Uh, facetious humor when Stephen realizes that he's having to deal with an outbreak of venereal disease on the ship and traces it back to mrs right. Wogan's maid and jack doesn't need much encouragement no. i think to get all all old-fashioned about women aboard ship and he says there are only three women aboard but they might as well be a troop of basilisks basilisks asks Stephen. yes you know basilisks they spread pests by glaring at people. There's this Peggy of yours. She'll reduce the whole ship's company to a parcel of noseless, toothless, bold paralytics unless she's headed up in a barrel with no bunghole. Oh, no. <laughs> so, good. Good line. Great snappy snappy dialogue from Jack. But he's uh, he's preaching to his own internal choir there, I think, about the dangers of women aboard ship. Right, right. And the women are also convincing the ship's crew that there's a ghost in the bowsprit netting. And this is a nice funny interlude as well, Mike, with uh, Stephen trying to add a bit of enlightenment, philosophy and rationality to the superstitions about the ghost. Well, and, and Stephen, it's so funny. He adds, tries to add a little rationality even to the gypsy woman, the prisoner. He goes to see her and said, what are you doing? You know, trying to convince everybody that there's a ghost here. And they, you know, she's saying, well, they pay me in bad silver. They get a bad fortune. And Stephen says, yeah, well, when they don't do their duty and we go down, you're going with them. So you better fix this. But he realizes that that alone, once the superstition is taken, her, you know, her waving it off is not going to do it. He knows he has to do something. And what he does is he goes out to the bowsprit at night and he invites Jack to come along. He said, yeah, you can come along. I'm going to do a bit of amateur exorcism. And Bondon doesn't want to go. And Jack makes some excuse about how he's washing his hair or something. It's, it's hilarious. Yeah, the the bravest men in the navy that we know, the bravest men in this cannon, are not going to the bowsprit at night. Not when there might be a ghost out there. Right? And Stephen gets accused, I think, of hocus pocus. I think he goes and uses some incantations or some holy water or some incense or something, and uh, people will turn their noses up at that as being, you know, Catholic ritual in the right out of place. But it doesn't matter. It convinces quite a few of the ship's crew who were Catholic anyway, and the rest of them think, okay, yeah, holy water, Latin, yeah, okay, I think we're good now. We're ready. We're ready. That's right. Well, it seems to have had another effect, or it might be totally unrelated, that the next morning after Stephen, who finally got Herapath to help him (laughs) and excise the ghost, Jack awakes from a sensual dream about Mrs. Wogan. And he's, he's a little upset that he's been, you know, pulled out of his sleep, but there's been a sail sighted and it appears to be the Dutchman. He Jack runs up on board. He's really incensed that Grant has, you know, this sail has been sighted and Grant has done nothing. He didn't call Jack up. You know, he hasn't changed sail. He's really uh, pretty upset about this. Yeah. And Jack tries to get a move on. And Stephen asks at breakfast, you do not mean to fight the Dutchman? Good heavens, no. What a fellow you are, Stephen. Wantonly tackle a 74 with 32 and 24 pounders and 600 men aboard. If a leopard half manned and with half the Dutchman's weight of metal can slip past him to the Cape, then she must do so with her tail between her legs. Ignominious flight is the order of the day. (laughs) Which, of course, he can say candidly across the breakfast table to Stephen. (laughs) Yeah. And obviously, this is the beginning of a, of a bit of a cat and mouse with the Vaxamheit, with the Dutch ship. And Jack expresses the wish, I think, that he had pullings still with him. And I can tell here that Stephen's confident he's on top of his game because he's able to flaunt his Catholicism a little bit in a good-natured way. He says, the good nuns, this is t- pullings being assured, being nursed by Catholic nuns, the good nuns will bear with Tom's nervous, fractious symptoms. He will thrive there where a common hospital might kill him. Even if he should be infected with a slight touch of genuflection, why, sure, it will do him no great harm in a service where the sense of rank is current to such Byzantine extremes. I love that. <laughs> it was well done. <laughs> you know, who knows? Maybe Pullings will uh, run into the Franciscans with, with, with the sloth drinking the altar wine there on shore. 
So rather than completely turning tail and indulging in ignominious flight, Jack decides to have a go at a bit of a long distance engagement with the Vaxam Height, maybe to discourage him, maybe to also scope out just how confidently he's handling his ship and to get some of Jack's own sixth sense about how this encounter with, with the Vaxam Height is going to go. And Jack says, in the bare stripped cabin to the gunner, now, Mr. Burton, we shall have some fun. And their pieces, the brass nine-pounders, were already loaded and run out. They stared along the gleaming barrels at the Vaxam Height, coming slowly up and throwing a fine bow wave. The gun crews crouched on either side. The slow match smouldered in its tubs. The powder men stood well behind, holding their cartridges. And they have this brief exchange, a brief exchange of fire with the Vaxam Height. The leopard loses part of her nose, and Jack gets to turn that into another joke about syphilis. And uh, Stephen summarises the day, and... Jack's feeling pretty comfortable with how it's gone and what he's learned. He says, old Butterbox did everything he could, very nearly made us uncomfortable. But he goes on to talk about how it would have been different if there'd been a heavier sea and signaling to imaginary friends. He says, having, I trust, bleared the honest burger's eye, each of us is peacefully carrying on our occasions, diverging farther and farther apart every watch all through the night so that by dawn we may well be a hundred miles apart. And Mike, I noticed something in the text here. When Jack makes a confident statement about the future, he's almost always grasping a belaying pin or the tabletop or the taffrail. Jack's not touching wood as he says this. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, Jack, you know what author O'Brien does to you when you claim victory in advance like that. (laughs) Yeah, this is not a good feeling here. So there's another dream of Mrs. Wogan. <laughs> oh, so yeah, he wakes up in the morning dreaming again of Mrs. Wogan, jerked from his sleep and learns that there is the Dutchman three miles closer. You know, they would outran her again, but Jack is really starting to get concerned. Somewhere along the line, I started remembering the scenes from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid as they're being tracked across the desert and the rocks oh, thinking, yeah. you know, Who are those guys? I couldn't do that. Could you do that? How can they do that? Who are those guys? And Jack even says, it was exactly as though he had been leaning over my shoulder last night while I worked out our course. Jack is kind of thinking, what is this guy doing? How does he know exactly where we are? I mean, he knows where we're going, but he's right on us, even through the night. And, And he gets worried. He's thinking that they're coming after him. But if Jack were the captain, he wouldn't be looking to sink her. He'd be looking to take her, uh, to board her. He's got all those men. He's at a distinct advantage. And one of the things that Jack thinks as a strategy, as, as they start to get a little closer again, Jack starts firing, saying he's got a lot of shot. He's captured some shot. He's had a little money. He put on a lot more shot. And I'll get her to expend a lot of her powder because she's so far from home and from any kind of the ability to pick up more supplies. But the Dutchman is happy to trade shot for shot and then some. And Jack is, uh, you know, even a little bit more surprised here. What he thought was a great thing for maybe hitting a powder box, maybe catching some of her rigging. But now it's gone from this opportunity to get his guys fired up and not just to be shot at while they're shooting and to try some real fire practice to, wow, how how come this guy's coming on so strong? And, and I think it's what makes this whole sequence of the action with the Vaxam Height so exciting, so compelling, so nerve shredding, and therefore so much written and talked about by people on the internet as they as you reread these books. The Chase with the Vaxam Height is one of the, the big highlights of the canon. And I think it's partly because even from this point and then further and further as we go through the story, it's personal for reasons that Jack can't fathom. He says here, it feels like the Dutch captain's looking over my shoulder. And later on, he sees other ways to convince himself that it's become personal for this Dutch nameless, previously nondescript captain aboard this vessel that we'd never heard of until two chapters ago. All of a sudden, it's personal. This guy's got this real implacable desire to seek out Jack. And because it's personal and we get to go deeply into Jack's perception of it, I think that's what makes it so, so thrilling and so exciting. Yeah. The other thing I want to say at this point, Mike, is that from this point on, this is a really great opportunity to follow the action on the canonade.net website. 
we, we had a great chat a few episodes ago with our friend Tom Horn, who runs that site. Tom's got really great blow-by-blow visualizations of where the vessels were and in which direction they went and when the changes of direction came. And it really, really helps to get the feeling of, first of all, where they were in space. And second of all, we realize that we're heading further and further south. We're heading into the very stormy, potentially very dangerous high southern latitudes. To begin with, things are calm, but the further south we go and the further Jack runs away from the Vaxham height, the further he's standing into danger with the weather in an undermanned ship. Yeah, and they I, I think it wouldn't be their first choice to go there, but the next night, Jack realizes that first they run all day in parallel courses, and Jack starts to get a little concerned and is watching for a possible boarding attempt. And sure enough, yeah. the the captain of Oxum Height send some ships away on the other side of his ship to come in around in a wide arc to get to the far side of the leopard while he engages Jack, you know, sort of ship to ship a little bit more. Jack luckily is really looking hard, spots the oars way out, and a little subtly breeze blows the leopard far enough that the boats can't get to him. And they fire some rounds of grape shot into the boats that are coming after them, really decimating the leaders. The Voxenheit has to stop, pick up the survivors. That gives Jack the time to get out ahead a little bit. But now Jack knows that any chance he gets in any calm, he's going to try to board them. And Jack can't afford that at all. So to your point, Ian, he heads straight south thinking, I've got to pick up the wind. I've got to get into some choppy seas and I got to get out of here. And he's got the enemy across the sea, and he's got a little bit of the enemy within as Grant and Mr. Fisher, the parson, and everybody, whenever any of Jack's compatriots are not close by, are talking up the ship's crew about how, you know, Jack should have fought him or he should have gone straight north, you know, all the different things that he should have done. And I think some of the crew perhaps becoming a little disconcerted about what are we doing? Why are we doing this? What's going to happen next? Yeah. And all these little minor reverses going on in the background for Jack. Grant and the crew are questioning him. The, the tactics that he has used so many times in the past, like you know, putting firecrackers in a barrel behind the ship and sailing off into the night, hoping to deceive the enemy, that didn't work. He's normally the one launching stealthy boat right. missions to board and cut out other vessels. He's the, he's the biter bit when it comes to that now. So he's under pressure. All of his tactics and his nous and his seamanship are really going to have to come together here if he can find his way around this very, very cunning, very, very well-prepared, very, very dogged opponent in the back height. Right. And in the middle of trying to get away, we've got this big scene in the gun room where the Marine Lieutenant Howard, who is the you know sort of the one good flute-playing character we've seen in the canon, uh, the master <laughs> who is drunk, goes after him and kills him in a drunken fit. Um, that lays Stephen low, and he's he's relating the incident to Mrs. Wogan. And in talking about it, he says, sometimes I feel that this is indeed an unlucky ship. Many of the men say there is a Jonah aboard. <gasps> so Jack thinks, again, he may have outrun the Dutch. He plans to turn north, but he worries He said, you know, I've I've killed a lot of the folks in that boarding attempt. And he knows that regardless of his outrunning the Dutchman, the Dutchman knows where he's headed, knows where he's headed. So he can always go to cut him off. And and sure enough, as as you say, if we watch Cannonade.net, we can follow this cat and mouse game and, and see what's happening here. But they do sight a sail the next morning. Luckily, it's not the Dutchman. No, that's right. It's a it's a whaler out of England that says they haven't seen any other ships, and we get this very brief moment of hope and respite when we think, okay, we're in the clear. But no, that same morning they're in the west northwest, directly to windward. So therefore, with with all of the tactical advantage in their hands, there is the Vaxam height. No hanging threat on the far horizon, but f- hull up, not three miles Ooh. away. And Jack goes straight into action. He makes sail, shakes out the reefs. The leopard turned round on her heels so fast that Babington's dog was flung outwards. And Jack, looking with his telescope back at the Vaxam height, can see the Dutch captain standing on her folks are looking straight at him. And again, Mike, this personal animosity is ratcheted up another notch. Jack can see the Dutch captain. 
he's wearing a black coat and he has this moment of horrid introspection where he thinks, oh my God, did I, did I kill some relative of his, his boy, perhaps, God forbid. So we're really in this chase with Jack now. We realize that it's personal and that the Dutch guy has had all the opportunity in the world to set this to one side and let the leopard go about its business. But the chase is on and there's no more deception. They've just got to flee. Yeah. And Jack loses a sail. The enemy gets closer. The enemy opens up with chasers and, you know, a ricochet from a shot smashes the coffee cup right out of Jack's hands. And at this point, I'm right about to start biting my nails off because this thing really is engaging. Oh, it really is. And the 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 scene has got tighter and tighter. We were up on the poop. Now we're in the cabin. And we're not just in the cabin. We're right there with Jack, with, as you say, Mike, the coffee cup in his hand. This is some of the most tense and the most exhilarating of O'Brien's writing and therefore, I think, of, of naval writing. Way more exciting and engaging, I've got to say, than, than the actions that we heard about in the Mauritius Command. Right. And I think O'Brien is enjoying writing this because he's picked up at his really, really great pace. He's giving us just enough of the naval context and the strategy to keep you oriented without having to follow all the ins and outs like I think we did in the Mauritius Command. And it's a single ship action as well. So we've got the chance to root for Jack alone. And Jack himself reflects, in single ship actions, the idea of capture usually predominates. He expected the 74 to hunt him down and take him or try to take him. In this sea, there was no possibility of capture, and the Dutch captain's intent could only be to kill. Any engagement must mean the total loss of the first ship to lose a mast or a vital sail, and thus the control of her run, the death of every soul aboard her. And Jack thinks to himself, a bloody-minded man. So, we're in the cabin, they cast loose the deadlights, they set the stern chasers on to fire back at the leopard, and the leopard ranges up really really close and the occasional maneuver manages to get the leopard a little bit of sea room and the chance to edge away as the two ships are firing you know we're kind of back to like this big storm we had before where there's massive waves and so the ships are kind of yeah you know they're coming into view they're up at the top then you know sometimes one's down and one's up they're both firing at each other um and and are getting really close here and jack is saying you know to his gunner saying a hole in her four topsail might make it split because the the Dutchman's landing certainly landing shots on the leopard and, and and damaging the leopard's rigging and sails as well. Yeah, and as the leopard starts losing more rigging, Jack starts his water over the side. He's thinking we got to do anything to get out from under here, which is a pretty ominous step. I think the last time we heard of Jack doing that, he was about to get captured by um, French Admiral Lenoir off the coast of France way back at the beginning of the, uh, right. the cannon. So it's, it foretells that they're in pretty dire straits. And they hit the enemy's foretopsail and it doesn't split. And we really think that this is going down to the very wire. The Vaxham Height lands a shot close to Jack's gun and there's this great explosion of splinters and noise and devastation and water in the cabin and Jack's taken a splinter wound to the head. Stephen sews him up. Jack staggers back to his gun. Another shot rings out and then suddenly there's cheering. Through the shattered deadlight, it says, he saw the Dutchman's foremast lurch, lurch again, the stays part, the mast and sail carry away right over the bows. The leopard reached the crest, green water blinded him. It cleared and through the bloody haze running from his cloth, that's Jack's head wound, he saw the vast breaking wave with the Vaxham height broadside on its curl, on her beam ends, broached too. An enormous momentary turmoil of black hull and white water, flying spars, rigging that streamed wild for a second, and then nothing at all but the great hill of green grey with foam racing upon it. My God. Oh, my God, he said. 600 men. Wow. So, lucky Jack. Lucky in a way that we've not seen him be lucky before. Right. Right. And also really obviously struck by the terrible loss of life and by the, the outcome of this, this duel that was, that was personal. And if, it, you know, if it's personal, Jack feels the plight and he feels the loss of the other side just as much as he feels it for his own side, I think. I think he, he really does. And that's it's really amazing in a, in a fight that could have been the toss of a coin at any second. 
you know, who's going to prevail in this thing? And and the leopard and Jack certainly at a great disadvantage uh, for Jack still to pause and reflect back on the great losses of the Dutch there is amazing. Yeah. And Jack having, you know, we kind of, you know, Jack's not only gotten his, his enormous head wound from the splinter as he had gone back up to the gun, it hit a recoil. He couldn't get out of the way. He's gotten a leg damaged here. You know, he's kind of crawled back up to see this thing. And still, he's thinking about them, not about him. He is, and I think he's still got plenty of challenges to face. He's had to run a long way south. Can he find a way to get back to the Cape in the westerly storms? Does that mean that Stephen can still take up his chance to poison the well of French intelligence with this false letter that he's planted with Herapath and Wogan? What's going to happen with Grant and the crew, who some of whom are clearly dissatisfied with some of Jack's conduct? How are they going to find their way to Botany Bay? And we've just poured our water over the sides and we're in the midst of Antarctica. <laughs> what do we do now? I think there's plenty to find out about next time. Uh, what do you say into a little bit more Patrick O'Brien next week? Ah, oh, with all my heart. Probably take this. <laughs> Third time's the charm.